The COVID-19 pandemic isn't the first time we have had to fight this battle. What were some of these past events and what did we do to deal with them? Lessons from pandemics past, tonight, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. We return tonight with an historical perspective of the current pandemic. Where is our past pushing us today? However, we will be happy to address any of your questions about the COVID-19 pandemic as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us remotely tonight are Dr. Lon Keitlinger, former South Dakota state epidemiologist, and Dr. Joshua Clayton, the current South Dakota state epidemiologist. I'd like each of you to talk a little bit about your background. Lon, would you start us off? Certainly. Hi. Good evening. I'm Lon Keitlinger. I am from, uh, grew up in Selby, South Dakota. I did my undergrad work in Augustana. I did a master's degree in public health and pathology at Tulane, and then a PhD at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in epidemiology and parasitology. I then worked in Madagascar for 20 years and returned to South Dakota in 1998 and worked for the health department for about another 20 years. I worked alongside Josh. Josh was uh, my summer intern. We worked together thereafter for several years. So I'm glad to have this position now. Uh, I retired in November of 2017, and I quit the Peace Corps. I went back to Madagascar as a Peace Corps volunteer, grassroots. I lived in a very small village at a little clinic and uh, did uh, community, community health work, area, plague, uh, malnutrition, uh, pregnancy. You know, all kinds of then last week all peace volunteers all over the world were evacuated and we you hours notice to the capital city and uh leave madagascar 140 plus peace volunteers in the country uh were on a plane in Ethiopia and, and uh, eventually got back to the united states last week so here I am. I'm still not back in my house. I'm back in Pier, though. I'm uh, almost ready to go back to work, uh, if they'll have me. And um, so here I am. Uh, but I certainly defer to Josh, because he's up to date on everything. And I've been living uh, without much email or without much news for the past two years. So I can talk about the past, but I will leave the presence to Josh. Yeah, I appreciate you still joining us and and uh, and, and, and your expertise. And, and I can't imagine being in a village in Madagascar one week and then finding yourself back in South Dakota one week later. It just shows how things have changed uh, in such a short amount of time. Tell us a little bit about your background. Certainly. Um, so I was uh, uh, South Dakota born and raised, uh, graduated high school from Baltic High School, uh, went to South Dakota State University for my undergraduate degree. Uh, following that, uh, I was uh, hired on as an intern uh, with the South Dakota Department of Health and worked uh, under Lon's tutelage. Uh, I then became um, a DIS, which is a, a, one of our investigators for infectious diseases. Uh, and then worked also uh, doing influenza surveillance uh, at Lon's urging. Uh, I did go pursue my master's in public health degree from the University of Michigan. Uh, also stayed at the University of Michigan for my PhD in epidemiology. Uh, following completion of my uh, degree at uh, University of Michigan, I was accepted into the Epidemic Intelligence Service Program, which is a two-year fellowship from CDC. I was assigned to the uh, Tennessee Department of Health. Uh, during that time, I was deployed uh, to help engage uh, the response for chikungunya virus, as well as uh, Ebola in West Africa. Uh, and then I started working as the deputy state epidemiologist uh, in Indiana, 
Uh, and then uh, upon Lon's retirement as the state epidemiologist in South Dakota, uh, I uh, became the, the state epidemiologist here for the state. Excellent, thank you. And, and Lon, if you would, what is an epidemiologist and, 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 and what's, uh, what's the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? Oh, an ep epidemiologist, we just track the diseases and are a disease fighter, some call us a disease detective. Uh, although um, Josh and I, we probably spend more time behind a computer than any place else. Uh, and as, as far as the disease goes, you have a single case, you have a cluster of cases. If you have more cases in one place, you call it an outbreak. If you have more than uh, what you actually expect, and it's maybe statewide or here in the region, we would call that, a, that an epidemic. But then if you have a lot of cases and it's in multiple countries around the world, that's a pandemic. So uh, outbreak, epidemic, pandemic, it's just uh, a matter of numbers and degree. Pandemic is, is uh, the highest, it's, it's, it's as high as you get. So now we're here in a pandemic because it's all over the world. And, yes. and Josh, um, would you give us an update of our numbers in South Dakota now and where we're at? Certainly. Uh, so just today, uh, the South Dakota Department of Health reported out an additional 63 cases of COVID-19 infection. Uh, we have an additional five hospitalizations uh, that were reported. Uh, and we did have six individuals uh, that recovered from COVID-19 infection. Uh, those individuals uh, are no longer isolated to their home uh, and they're no longer considered infectious. Uh, and so they have been released from that isolation. Uh, in total in the state, what we've seen is 165 cases of COVID-19. That does include, unfortunately, two deaths that have occurred in the state. Uh, we do have 57 individuals who have recovered uh, from COVID-19 in its entirety. Uh, and we do have 17 individuals who are uh, ho have been hospitalized uh, due to the infection. Is there anything you're using as an estimate based off of the number of known cases to, to figure out how many possible cases we have in the state? Uh, that's a very good question. And, and what it comes down to is uh, we know we have uh, a large number of the cases being tested, um, but we know that that's also uh, an underestimate uh, for uh, what we're seeing as far as uh, individuals who may be ill within the community. Uh, COVID-19 in and of itself uh, is a very uh, mild to moderate infection uh, for about 80% of all individuals. And that does mean that uh, those folks are able to uh, maintain kind of normal life and not have uh, the, uh, um, the difficulty breathing that would uh, require someone to seek uh, medical care or potentially be hospitalized with the infection. A viewer from Brookings asks, why are we hearing such variable estimates about when the peak will happen in South Dakota? Like initially they heard late May, early June, and now we might be hearing July or August. Josh, if you would, what are, what are some of these models based off of and are they changing? So it is important to note that uh, a model is only as good as the data that's being uh, you know, pulled into it uh, in order to uh, produce that output. And so what we have uh, is over time, we actually have better and better data to help inform the model. Uh, the information um, you know, that uh, if you look out on the website uh, or out on, on the, the web, uh, you'll find that uh, there's a lot of uh, different models that are out there that help, try and help predict what we might see. Uh, the main focus that we have at the Department of Health is, is to uh, identify what those models might help tell us uh, about uh, you know, peak for the pandemic, uh, but also what it might mean for uh, our total number of uh, hospital beds that we need in order to care for people uh, who will become sick with COVID-19. Uh, so it really comes down to um, there are a lot of different ways to model and a lot of different assumptions uh, that uh, go into those models. And so uh, the models will change over time. As those models have, you know, and will change and have changed, would, do you think we're flattening the curve or are we still just in the infancy of this pandemic? Uh, we are still very much uh, at the early part of this pandemic. Uh, kind of what's called the uh, 
uh, acceleration phase. Uh, that means that the number of cases uh, of COVID-19 that we're seeing is increasing uh, sometimes day by day, sometimes week by week. Uh, and we are, will be continuing uh, in that acceleration phase and, and speeding up um, and, until such time as we do get to that peak uh, of the pandemic. Uh, overall, I think that, uh, you know, I'm heartened to hear uh, some of the stories uh, and what people have done to try and, uh, you know, decrease their overall risk, uh, you know, within the community. Um, you know, we have schools um, that are closed. We have individuals that are working from home. Uh, we have uh, other folks who are, you know, practicing good social distancing, uh, which is, you know, staying away from other people uh, and keeping about six feet space between you, uh, one another. You mentioned the six feet, and a Facebook viewer had just asked that new MIT research suggests that 27 feet is a safe distance better than six feet. Is that recommended by the CDC, or have you heard much about that? Uh, so it, it, it's uh, not something that is uh, typically uh, seen when you're talking about the primary mode of transmission uh, with COVID-19. Uh, what we know is that an individual, as they're talking or coughing or sneezing, um, every time you do that, there are little droplets um, that, that do are expelled from your mouth. And they uh, do hang in the air a little bit, uh, which is why we, you know, we go even a little bit further than arm's length uh, when we're talking about how far some of those little droplets will travel. Um, but it is, uh, you know, standard uh, that the uh, infections like this that are, are primarily focused on droplet transmission, which is that droplet uh, uh, being the main source of spreading it, uh, is six feet. Um, what, what that uh, other research might be talking a little bit about is um, some of the particles that can stay suspended in the air a little bit longer, um, you know, that might be resulting in uh, some of the MIT modeling that's out there, um, but that is not kind of the common practice. You know, there's a lot of talk about a shortage of supplies and some people are making masks. And there's also talk about whether we should all be wearing masks when we go out into public. What, how do you feel about all the masks? What would you recommend everyone wear them? So I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, why do we have masks? And the, the important part is that uh, individuals in the community, um, you know, are not really helped um, by most of the masks that are used in healthcare. Uh, you know, we have specific masks uh, called N95s um, that are actually respirator masks. And those are designed and needed to be fitted to a person's face and are most often used by healthcare professionals. Um, there are other that are surgical masks that simply provide a barrier um, between, uh, you know, somebody that uh, might be ill uh, and yourself. Uh, and there are uh, particles that are potentially can work this way around the mask as you're breathing in and out. Uh, so you need to think about it as uh, a uh, just a simple barrier, really, um, it, to help avoid some of those uh, small droplets, um, you know, that uh, might be expelled from somebody as they're uh, coughing or sneezing um, from getting into your mouth. But overall, uh, the general consensus is that, you know, masks are not uh, used uh, widely because they really do need to be reserved for healthcare professionals and for uh, Ill, Ill patients. And it would seem the safest thing is to stay home. That's definitely true. Uh, whether you're uh, talking about staying at home because you are showing symptoms uh, or whether you're talking about uh, staying at home and uh, practicing social distancing, uh, both of which are very effective uh, at helping prevent illness. Thank you. Well, today's COVID-19 pandemic is often compared with the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Bonnie Specker, an epidemiologist and professor at South Dakota State University, dug into the similarities and differences. If you look at the pattern for the influenza outbreak, you see um, three distinct waves of the disease. The first wave occurred in the spring of 1918 in Fort Riley, Kansas. And if you remember your American history, that was World War I, and that was with military recruits, 
and about 100 cases, 100 um, GIs came down with this disease in a day. The next day it was 500. And it eventually kind of petered out in the spring and went down to minimal cases during the summer. And then there was a second wave of cases in the fall of 1918. That's where the majority of the deaths occurred. About a third of the world's population was affected by this epidemic in 1918. And about 50 million deaths occurred worldwide. There were 675,000 deaths in the United States. It's probably one of the worst epidemics and when you look at the history of it and what's been done about it, one of the things that's amazing is how people forget about it. Like it's, it was never mentioned once it ended, everyone just sort of ignored it and put it out of their conscious memory. Um, the fatality rate of the flu of 1918 was about 2%. Mm -hmm which is about what it is for this coronavirus. The coronavirus may actually be a little bit higher than that. It's not quite sure yet. The reason the flu of 1918 was so bad was that it had never, that virus, we know now that it was a virus. Back then, they didn't know what a virus was, but no one had ever seen that disease before. So there was no immunity. None of the population was immune to it. Also, there were no vaccines back then for the flu. So the only real way to control it was through isolation or quarantining people, um, good hygiene, you know, washing your hands, doing everything that we're being told to do now. And the other important thing was the best way to handle these are to prohibit or limit public gatherings. And that didn't occur in 1918, because again, it was the war. So people were going to um, the bond parades and going into the draft or the sign-up thing. They were going, getting put on ships, being sent to Europe, being in ditches with other people. So there was a lot of very close contact. And I think that that probably is one of the reasons why that epidemic was so bad was that they didn't couldn't implement a lot of these public health strategies that we know are important and that they knew but they couldn't the country was in the middle of a war if you look at the influenza milestones what you see is that in 1917, the life expectancy is about 54 for women and 48 for men. And during that influenza epidemic, it did affect the young people more. So the 20 and 30 year olds were the ones that died during that epidemic, which is different from the current coronavirus. The life expectancy actually dropped 12 years during that epidemic so that you know, it had dropped significantly by the end in 1919, the final wave occurred, and then it, it sort of hung around for about 38 years until the 1950s. In the 1950s, the H2N2 virus ends up taking over. That influenza of 1918 is later found out to be caused by H1N1. In the 1950s, H2N2 takes over as the more common one. Again, this is a new virus. No one is familiar with it, it causes a pandemic. In 1960, the Public Health Service starts recommending people at high risk get vaccinated for influenza. And then in 1968, we come up with the H3N2 virus, flu virus, and then that triggers a pandemic. Again, no one has seen this virus, so no one has any immunity to it. One of the interesting things I find is that when I first started teaching epidemiology and we talk about this epidemic, no one knew what caused it at that time. And then in the late 1990s, people realized that they could isolate the virus or bacteria or whatever it was because they identified places in the far north where they knew people had died like in the permafrost, and the CDC actually went up and took out samples of the lungs of these people who had died in 1918, brought them back to Atlanta, where they then isolated the virus and sequenced it. 
and realize it's an H1N1. Okay, so H1N1 sort of disappears in 1950. They realized that the Spanish flu or the flu of 1918 was caused by H1N1. And then in 2008, um, they start seeing enough, more cases of H1N1 popping up. And they realize this is going to be a problem because if it's anything like it was in 1918 with this population that doesn't have any immunity, then you don't want a repeat of 1918. So they started, they had the vaccine, they had the sequences, so they started mass producing the vaccine and really were able to curb that outcome. This is your program, and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion. Call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. So, Lon, we were just hearing about the H1N1 uh, pandemic from 1918, and then it came back in 2009 and uh, you were state epidemiologist then. Could you tell us a little bit about that and what were some of the similarities and differences between our current pandemic and, and 10 years ago? Yeah, 10 years ago, well, 11 years ago, I guess now, it was in April of 2009. Um, there were a few cases in Mexico and they were novel viruses. And the first two weeks were horrific. They were experiencing, I guess, predicting a very high death rate, very rapid spread. But then as the month of April went on and we got into it a few weeks, we realized that it was probably a milder virus. And then with, there's some seasonality to influenza. And then during the summer, uh, in North America, we had just a trickle of cases all during the summer here in South Dakota. I believe every week we had uh, a case or two. And then in September, it started going up, up, up the trajectory of, of cases. And it climaxed in um, uh, October of 2009. Nobody had immunity to that virus. It was a new H1N1 uh, strain of virus. Um, but the thing about it was, it was influenza. So we had uh, capacity to build a vaccine. And between April and October, uh, a vaccination was um, produced, uh, tested, uh, field trialed, and dispersed. So uh, really, the, the, the curious and almost heartbreaking thing about it was the epidemic or the pandemic that year peaked about the time that the vaccine was being rolled out uh, here in South Dakota. We mobilized the whole state. We had excellent um, cooperation from all our healthcare partners and uh, stakeholders all over the country, all, all over the state. Uh, we did a massive vaccination effort. We kicked into place most of the things that you're hearing now, the, uh, the hand washing, the cover your cough, the social distancing. It didn't go to the extreme and to the extent of what's happening now. There weren't mass school uh, closures. Some schools closed individually because a lot of kids were sick or a lot of uh, teachers were sick, but there was no mass uh, closure of schools or businesses or churches or sports events like we're doing now. So that was almost um, a dress rehearsal for what we're, what, what we're doing now. Uh, South Dakota, we, I must say, we're, we're proud of our vaccination effort. We had the highest vaccination rate of any state in the country due to that, uh, during that uh, pandemic years. And it was, um, it was difficult because there wasn't vaccination for everybody on day one. It had to be trickled out. So we had um, we had the, the population of the state divided into priority groups. Top priority were uh, health care providers, and then young children, and then pregnant women, and then people in essential, essential um, services, and so on and so forth, until it really got out to the general population. But we were able to vaccinate a good number of the people across the state, in every county, and every community, uh, in rapid order, the people of South Dakota really stepped up. And, you know, fortunately, it was a fairly mild uh, uh, pandemic strain that, that uh, went, went around. We had, uh, I believe, 26 or 24 deaths that year, and 400 and some hospitalizations. So, you know, when you take that in context of normal flu, it wasn't so bad. But the response was there. 
And it was a dress rehearsal almost 10 years ago that we had for what, what's happening now. I, re I remember that well. I was in my first year of residency and I was working at a VA hospital in Idaho. And uh, my clinic had gotten me the vaccine, but the doctors I was working with at the VA, for whatever reason, didn't have access to it yet. And they, each of them on my team, came down with lab confirmed H1N1 influenza and got pretty sick and, and couldn't work and helped me out. So I was alone on our team taking care of our, of our patients. Uh, we have a lot of questions uh, in from, from our viewers. And, and I'd like to ask uh, Josh, it says, a viewer from Peer asks, can you explain what you mean by recovered? How do you know when someone is recovered? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, what we do focus on is that uh, individuals are considered recovered uh, after they have uh, are no longer considered infectious um, and can no longer spread uh, the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we that's determined, um, you know, from CDC. They looked at, you know, how long does it take someone uh, to, uh, you know, no longer. Uh, produce the virus uh, in their body, uh, and they've done they've done that by looking at uh, collecting samples from positive cases uh, over a number of days. Uh, so you know every two days or so um, that they were looking at uh, collecting a sample and testing that to see when individuals uh, were con no longer considered um, to be able to spread that virus. What they found. Uh, was that uh, an individual um, is uh, typically no longer able to spread the virus uh, after seven days of, after their symptom onset. And if they have fever, uh, they have to be at least three days past their fever. So uh, the general um, focus is also that in general improvement in their symptoms uh, needs to be occurring. Uh, so what that means uh, for just a, a, somebody who is a very mild infection, um, you know, maybe doesn't even have fever, uh, is that the first day um, that they start to develop that cough, uh, you add seven days, uh, and that's when a person, uh, and, and they have an improvement in that cough, that's when a person is considered to be uh, recovered from the virus. They can no longer spread it to an individual. Uh, the uh, second example is somebody who uh, has a fever, and d uh, that fever remains around for, say, the first six days of their illness. Um, so you have to take uh, add, add, uh, three additional days uh, past day six um, to get to day nine. So we're looking at um, at least that for that person um, that they have to be at uh, uh, nine days after their illness onset in order for them to be released from isolation and considered no longer able to spread the virus. Um, so what that means is we don't have a one-size-fits-all uh, definition of when a person can be released from isolation. Uh, and what that also means is that uh, sometimes it does take uh, folks at the health department to be able to help people understand uh, when they can come out of isolation. Uh, we do, for those individuals who have recovered from the virus, we do provide a letter stating that they have completed uh, their isolation period and that they are no longer considered infectious to others within the community. I heard they're coming out with a blood test to tell if someone's been infected or not. Do you see that as a valuable piece uh, of, of trying to do that on a large scale to be able to tell people if they're no longer capable of being infected? I think, uh, you know, the, the current methods are primarily focused on, uh, you know, detecting the, the DNA uh, or sorry, the RNA of the, the virus. And so uh, having additional testing capabilities, uh, you know, whether that's uh, identifying that a person has developed antibodies after being exposed um, to the, the virus and, and may have uh, developed illness, uh, is an important piece in order to uh, let individuals know that they had the virus and that, um, you know, if they're still experiencing symptoms, if they're still early on in their infection, um, that they should be uh, following those guidelines to be released from isolation. 
Uh, so any uh, additional testing that we can get uh, within the community, uh, whether that be focused on uh, de detecting the RNA of the virus uh, or whether that's focused on uh, detecting the body's response to that virus, uh, will be very helpful in our fight against COVID-19. Yeah, I hope we can do more and more tests. It repeats itself, so how might that translate with the current pandemic? The big one was the Spanish flu of 1918 and 1919. One thing that stands out from this uh, and in comparison to the situation today is just the numbers, the astounding numbers of people who died. That includes in South Dakota, 1,093 in South Dakota was a lot, but 50 million worldwide and hundreds of thousands in the United States. Um, another thing is that it came in waves. There were about three separate waves starting in late 1918 and then in 1919 they came and went uh, with, uh, with a great deal of speed. Another one is the geographic differential that it didn't hit every place in the state in the same way and I'm sure there's a lot more research that could be done on that. Another is the slowness with which some public officials figured out what was going on and what to do. Um, and that took a while for it to sink in and once it sank in, it was almost too late. Um, these kinds of things, the mysteriousness of the whole thing, how little was known then and even today about why it arose so quickly and why it then it disappeared so quickly. Then you think about as the first explorers and travelers, fur traders up the Missouri River came, they brought their diseases with them and infected a lot of the Indian tribes which, uh, you know, killed as many as half or more of them in a short period of time. There were also the cholera epidemics of the 1830s and 1850s and 1810s that uh, would have had some effect or other, but it's hard to know because there really aren't many written records about that in the area. One thing that needs to be said is that there's been very much, very little written about this. The standard textbook on South Dakota history, Herbert Shell, has nothing about the flu epidemic. Um, Robert Carl Levitz tells us that the Spanish flu killed 1,093 people, according to the State Board of Health. Well, as a historian, we always like to think that there are lessons to be learned from history. I think just paying attention, being aware, and using our imaginations to think about what the possibilities possibilities are um, and uh, perhaps getting prepared for things uh, so that uh, uh, we, we know how to react when they occur. We've seen from uh, the, those charts on there, the 1918 flu pandemic had come in a few different waves. Um, do you think the virus will dissipate during the summer months and return with a second wave in the fall? Josh? So, yeah, so yeah, I think that um, uh, it, it's a little bit hard uh, to know that at this point in time. Uh, there are differences in, uh, you know, influenza virus versus um, the COVID-19 virus, which is a, a coronavirus. Um, you know, what we do know is that, uh, you know, influenza historically has had a couple different uh, waves with each of the successive um, pandemics. Uh, it is unknown whether, uh, because this is a different virus, uh, whether we will see you know, it just continue on and instead of, uh, uh, you know, having uh, individuals uh, who develop illness now kind of in the springtime, uh, there's a little bit of a decrease in transmission over the summer, uh, and uh, then have it come back uh, again in the fall. Uh, I think it's going to be important to keep an eye uh, on, uh, you know, globally what's happening and uh, what we have seen is it has not really let up uh, in any jurisdiction. Uh, I think it, it's important to, to be prepared um, that what we will see is a continued increase uh, in the number of cases uh, and that, you know, we'll see uh, a first uh, larger wave uh, and whether that means we will uh, see a second wave um, or whether that will be absent uh, is, is unknown. But I think we do need to plan uh, for that uh, eventuality. 
um, have not having a plan, uh, you know, will lead to more individuals uh, developing illness, uh, more hospitalizations, uh, and more deaths. And I think we need to focus on, you know, what we're trying to do is to, trying to prevent uh, individuals from becoming ill um, and individuals from being hospitalized. Yeah, you know, we're seeing this spread around the whole world. This viewer asks, do we know if the virus lives better in cold air or warm air? I think what we know generally about uh, respiratory viruses, so this includes, uh, you know, the common cold, which uh, coronavirus is a part of those, uh, in those uh, common cold viruses, uh, as well as influenza, is that, uh, you know, typically they do uh, survive better in that uh, colder climates, uh, the air is a little bit drier, um, but uh, it, it's not to say that we don't have individuals becoming ill uh, with respiratory viruses uh, all year round. So, Yeah, and, and the, our COVID-19 is a, a coronavirus, and, and there was the SARS outbreak in 2003, which is also a coronavirus. Lon, I'm wondering if you couldn't share with me some comparisons to that outbreak and anything we can learn from that. SARS, that's another coronavirus. It's, it's the evil sister of this one that's uh, circulating now. But every year there's uh, a more generic coronaviruses uh, out there and they cause the sniffles or the, or the common cold and uh, are not much thought of, uh, are, although they are in the respiratory panel. However, in uh, 2003, the spring of 2003, uh, SARS emerged from China, again from a bat, and made its way to Hong Kong, and then made its way into uh, Toronto, Canada, had a large outbreak, Vietnam, Singapore. Uh, so we were getting ready for a big outbreak here in the United States. But all told, we had uh, 27 human cases in the United States. Uh, South Dakota, we had no cases. And I guess what um, our, the, the public health control measures were very similar. Uh, you know, wash your hands, cough in your sleeve, um, we quarantined people. I, I was surprised at the number of people who were in China yesterday, and then the next day they were right here in the middle of South Dakota. We had a number of those people, and lo and behold, they were coughing and they and they had a fever. So they were um, you know, put into isolation until we could get uh, them tested. Fortunately, they had other respiratory diseases and not SARS here in uh, South Dakota uh, at that time. So again, uh, a dress rehearsal. The best thing about that SARS was uh, it fizzled away. In two th after 2004, there were no more cases ever recorded. Why did it go away? I, I don't know. I'm sure somebody does. But um, so here we are, uh, 2019, uh, 2020 again. Here another coronavirus. SARS number two hits us again with, which, with uh, much more ferocity more pathogenicity and is really spreading. It's making a lot of people sick and it's killing a lot of people too. And, uh, and, and because of that, that's why we want to, to have these measures to, to, to stay away from each other as best we can. You know, as we go along and this goes longer and longer, uh, Josh, you know, when we get the urge to be together with other people, um, how should we remind ourselves that that might undermine our, our entire public health intervention here? Yeah, I think it, it's key to note that uh, it's really important to uh, stay the course. You know, we, we know what will be effective to decrease uh, the overall number of uh, COVID-19 infections that we see. Uh, and that's really that idea of uh, social distancing. So doing, uh, you know, what we're doing now and limiting our contact uh, with others in the community. Uh, you know, I look, I like to look at it on a, a weekly basis. So, uh, you know, limiting the number of people that you're coming into contact uh, throughout the week. So, you know, if normally that was uh, 30 or 40 people, that might have included, uh, you know, individuals from your church, it might have included uh, individuals from work, uh, it, and it would have included uh, others that, um, you know, maybe your neighbors that you uh, spend time with on a regular basis. I think the, the key thing to, to note is that, um, you know, doing even a little bit, um, you know, of uh, uh, that, that um, the mentality of, of staying at home 
uh, you know, is important. So uh, staying at home, um, not going to work, uh, really does have an impact in decreasing the overall people that you come into contact with because uh, you, you have to realize that it's not just uh, your neighbor um, is, that you're having contact with. It really is, well, who, do, who was your neighbor around? Um, you know, did they go to work? Uh, you know, uh, were they um, uh, out, uh, you know, speaking with another neighbor and, and so on down the down the line? And really it's uh, that idea that uh, every, every individual that you come into contact with is, is not the only individual uh, that uh, you have been around or that they have been around. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that big time. It just, it just builds and builds. The more any adding one person, what about all the 20 people that they might have been in contact with for the last week? And it just grows exponentially from there. But we still need to support one another and stay connected. And uh, so, you know, so people don't feel isolated. So I, I'd add that, that, you know, having conversations through technology that we have this that they didn't have 100 years ago. And um, right before I came here, my daughter was, was talking with the rest of her first grade class uh, on Zoom, and they would have had about a dozen or twenty of them all on the screen at once, and it was, it was the the cutest thing, and she was so happy. And so, you know, if you can call up someone that you love or that you haven't talked to for a while, and 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 show them that you care, I think that can go a long ways in in helping us all get through this and to support each other in our self isolation efforts. We'll be right back after this. We feel privileged to have had the honor of creating a legacy of service through the Prairie Doc organization. It has been our desire and goal to share health information that is not influenced by marketing or sales, but rather is based on science. We started in the 80s with a newspaper article and expanded in the 90s with a radio show. In 2003, we started a TV program, and in 2010, we added our social media platforms. This has been a team effort made possible by many volunteer physicians and experts serving as hosts and guests. All of them are Prairie Docs. Thanks to them, we've been given the ability to pass the torch so that this legacy may continue beyond my time on this earth. Please join me in embracing our team of Prairie Doc physicians, each committed to this mission. Family physician Andrew Ellsworth, Deb Johnston, and Jill Cruz, along with internist Kelly Evans, all from Brookings, South Dakota. These volunteer physicians, and many others, have in the past and will in the future serve as authors of Prairie Doc newspaper columns, host of our TV and radio programs. Thank, Thank you. you. When I come home from a day at the clinic and hospital, there is no better feeling than my children running up to give me a big hug. For the past couple of weeks, I've had to remind them to stop and just do an air hug until I have had a chance to change clothes and shower. The idea is to wash away any germs and decrease the risk of getting my family sick after working with several patients and sick people during the day. Maybe these efforts are too much, or maybe they are not enough. The COVID-19 virus spreads through respiratory droplets from talking, coughing, or sneezing, and appears to also spread via the fecal-oral route. The fecal-oral route is often how the stomach flu spreads, and many of us know how easily that circulates through families and daycares. Someone who has been to the bathroom may touch a doorknob or a serving spoon, which someone else touches before eating, and they may become infected. That's why we need to wash our hands well and avoid touching our face and our food. Unfortunately, the virus can spread from people that do not have symptoms or before they have symptoms, which is why, I worry, I may not be doing enough to protect my family from the one person who puts them at the biggest risk, me. Some doctors and nurses are deciding to avoid their families altogether and live in the garage or the basement when they come home. I haven't decided to do that yet, but maybe I should, or maybe I will. Pandemics and disease have separated families for longer than the history books can tell us. Before they knew the cause, our ancestors knew that if someone had smallpox, quarantine and fire 
were the only ways to help prevent the spread. People, houses, and entire cities were quarantined. Disease has arguably decided more wars than the battles themselves. During the 1918 influenza pandemic, soldiers from Fort Riley carried the disease to other American military bases and from there to the battlefront in Europe. These lessons of history helped us learn about how to control disease. Advancement in infection control, medicines, and vaccinations have turned the tide and made many diseases a distant memory. For COVID-19, we do not yet have proven medications or a vaccine. However, we are learning more every day how to help those who are sick and how to better prevent the spread. In the meantime, my family and I will continue to practice social distancing and similar efforts to do our part to flatten the curve and slow the spread, to give us time to find treatments to combat this current scourge on humanity. A big thank you to our guests, Lon and Josh, for joining us remotely to add their experience and knowledge to our discussion tonight. If you would like more information about this program or to see more episodes, please like and follow us on Facebook, visit us at prairiedoc.org, and listen to the Prairie Doc on your favorite podcast platform. We would also like to thank everyone who helped create this special report. All of the Prairie Docs, the production crew, the phone volunteers, the SDSU School of Communication and Journalism, the South Dakota Department of Health, South Dakota Public Broadcasting, the South Dakota, South Dakota Board of Regents, and South Dakota State University for allowing us back on campus to get this important information to all of you at home. With most of our attention on COVID-19, we cannot forget other important health concerns. In the U.S., diabetes and pre-diabetes affect over 100 million people costing more than $325 billion each year. The documentary, Blood Sugar Rising, puts human faces to these statistics, exploring the history and science of the illness through portraits of Americans whose stories shaped the film. Blood Sugar Rising will air on South Dakota Public TV on Wednesday, April 14th, from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. As for On Call with the Prairie Doc, for the next two weeks, we will be airing new programs that were recorded with Dr. Holm as host. As many of you are likely aware, Dr. Holm passed away on March 22nd after three and a half year battle with pancreatic cancer. Our thoughts continue to be with the Holm family. Then on April 23rd, if appropriate, we will be back with an update of the COVID-19 pandemic status. That does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Will you be able to stay in your own home or move in with your children or into a retirement community? Are you prepared for long-term care? Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. Hello to all, I am Dr. Tom Luzier, a practicing allergist in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Born in Kansas, I embraced the diversity of South Dakota. This diversity comes with a price, limited health care resources and information. The Healing Words Foundation through Prairie Doc provides an open, online, interactive, public broadcasting format for reliable health information. As a member of the Healing Words Foundation board, I am asking you please to join me in support of this work, which is funded entirely by donations from you. Please consider making a personal or corporate gift to Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3, Go to prairie.org and click on the donate button and make a valuable contribution. Thank you. Major funding for On Call with Prairie Doc has been provided by 
Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialists, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Black Hills Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Flandreau Madison Brookings District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care, Sanford Clinic Community Services Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swift Hill Communications. <laughs>